Casual Magic has been brought to you by Cool Stuff Inc., where you can get cool stuff. Use the code CASUAL to get 5% off of your sale. And then also by Coalesce Apparel, where you can get really cool t-shirts and stuff. And use the code Casual Magic to get 10% off your sale. And by Architect, a deck hosting website that doesn't really sell anything, but they like me and I like them. So kindly use them. And now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Casual Magic, the show where we talk about the fun side of Magic the Gathering. My name is Shivam Putt and Casual Magic is brought to you by Cool Stuff Inc., Coalesce Apparel, and Architect. And I have just released my first ever piece of merchandise, a t-shirt that makes me look like Mario, but as a soldier token that's been turned into an angel. You'll understand if you know my decks. Uh, but you can go to uh, our Coalesce and pick one up now. They're really, really cool and I'm super excited about that. Today, though, I have a hella cool guest. I'm so stoked about this. Uh, I have Jonathan Young with me here today to talk about the soundtrack to Kamigawa, which, first off, uh, there's a soundtrack to Kamigawa, and it's awesome. <laughs> that is not something I would have said about four months ago, Yeah, but holy crap. Uh, thank you for joining me today, dude. This song, I mean, I sat and I listened to it, like, since it came out, I guess, as of recording, it came out like a week ago. And I've just been jamming it. It is sick. Thank you so much, man. And I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'm such a such a big <laughs> magic player. I uh, I have been kind of, um, you know, I I, I, I listen to a, a, and watch a lot of magic content. So mm. I've I've seen you before <laughs> uh, for years. I've I've seen your name pop up, and I think I've seen you like on other people's channels that I watch yes. as well. And I was listening to your episode with uh, with Prof. Um, earlier today so i'm ah. uh, I, uh I, i'm yeah the i'm still in shock you know <laughs> i'm still in shock that that this whole kamigawa soundtrack it's so happened. cool and uh because you know i i was thinking about actually like making some magic content at some point mm. and i i like was nervous to do it because like I'm a musician and I like <laughs> I, I I'm sure that like any anybody who's listening to this who's a content creator or a streamer can attest to like um anytime that you try to change lanes at all as a content oh, yeah. creator uh it's incredibly difficult to get your fans to be receptive to that and, boy uh, howdy yeah <laughs> one of the things that I learned when I started making content and I was talking to some of my friends about this I'm like what sorts of things should I do? And like, what, how should I name my YouTube channel, for instance, or yeah. what should I call my podcast? And they were like, first off, don't call it something that you're going to be pigeonholed into for the rest of your career. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, and he's like, yeah, I named my show the masters of modern. We don't really talk about modern anymore, but now I'm stuck. And I'm like, I listen Fair. to that podcast a lot. <laughs> I love dude. Alex Kessler is one of my dearest friends, but like he told me some life lessons there, which is like, you got to be careful when you're doing content. If you pick, like, that's one of the reasons why this is just a, an interview show more than like, like before this, I had a commander show. Yeah. And it was like five years I was doing it, which was just about commander every week. And I did this interview show specifically so that I'd be able to talk about anything yeah. and get away with it's casual magic. I can call it yeah. whatever I want. That's smart. That's smart. Cause otherwise you're exactly right. You have a huge ass audience on YouTube and they're all there for your, your cool cover songs and like your cursed Brunos. My son has been singing your evil version of Bruno. It's wild. Yeah. But like, how would they react to you suddenly being like, all right, guys, we're going to be cracking packs today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's weird, man, because like I, I originally started doing cover songs um, as a compromise. A compromise. Be yeah. Because I'm a songwriter. You know, I, I'm a songwriter and a producer and, and I mean, I, you know, I, I keep, I keep immediately thinking of like Magic the Gathering metaphors and this I, is a Magic I was, the Gathering show. I, I was doing the same thing when I was on Good Morning Magic with, with Gavin <laughs> who we're both, uh, we're both close with. Um, but, uh, I mean, imagine if like, imagine if you got signed to some kind of esports team as a Magic player and you were never allowed to build your own deck. 
you know, mm. like they, they always just handed you a debt. Like that's kind of what it feels like to be a cover artist. It's like, yeah. uh, like I, I get to perform a music, mm-hmm. which is like technically what I love doing, right. but, but, but you want like, it to be your music. Yeah. Like at heart, like, you know, it's same with magic, the gathering. Like I don't even really like piloting decks as much as I do building decks. You know what mm. I mean? So, um, and, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with making cover songs. Like I have a lot of, uh, friends who are also very prolific cover song artists, but, um, I really just, it's just not my thing, but I've, I've gotten such a, a big following, uh, doing it because of like the, the internet clickbait mm-hmm. era and, and, uh, the I way mean, that... if you do a cover song of whatever the latest TikTok song is, you're yeah. guaranteed to get like a hundred thousand, 300,000 views. Right. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's similar to a lot of magic content, right? It's like it when a new, w- w- when a new spoiler card comes out, uh, the first person to post a video analyzing the spoiler card always gets a ton of views. Yes. Um, but then there's all of these different caveats with that, like where, um, if they have a bad take about that spoiler and it turns out to be, uh, mm. wrong, then that video immediately drops off or, so there's kind of this balance between, um, and this goes for any type of content creation. Like, are you going to ride the waves of the trends or are you going to make content that is like marketing people call it evergreen content? You I know was just I mean? about to say, I'm like, you can either be a slave to the algorithm or like you can just kind of build something that anybody can jump into at any point in time. Right. Yeah. Like, again, this podcast is a testament to that. This is one of the reasons why. I was tired of having to be the grind. I was tired of being like a cart dragged by whatever the new ox is. Yeah. Like, and because, <laughs> well, I mean, we had a pattern. It was like set co- preview. Okay. We're going to make a preview set. We're going to make a deck for the hot card. We're going to make a deck for the next legend. Now it's time for the next set to come. And I'm like, yeah. oh my God, we don't have any time to breathe. There's like 800 legends that just came out. I haven't even looked at, and we're like six sets ahead. Yeah. And with interviews, if I'm just talking to you about anything, somebody can come here three years from now and it's still going to be an awesome rap yeah, show. Exactly. And, and it's and, way better for my health. And yeah. And, and we say like these producers I work with, they always say you can't ring the bell twice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, um, once a card has been out for two years, nobody's going to go back and watch an episode about that card being revealed for the first time. And it it's is. the same with like pop music. Like that's why I used to do a lot of like back when Taylor Swift was still releasing like new, number one songs all the time i would do a lot of like taylor swift covers and i would do a Mm. lot of adele cover songs and and those were fine but as soon as billy eilish comes along nobody's searching for for taylor swift covers anymore and and there's all these i mean it's weird it's weird to talk about like that you know because it's like um and and i kind of hate it because it's like (laughs) you're, you're you're making art and you're making entertainment but you're also quantifying it based on like uh, how long yeah. is that art going to be valuable and why is that art valuable? Is that art valuable because of its relevancy mm. today and in, in the, in the present and that's going to immediately drop off or is it relevant because of, um, because it's just because they love the fundamental core. Of yeah. It, right? Yeah. And that's something that I'm, was so, so exciting to me about this Kamigawa mm. soundtrack is because, um, I was telling the the team at Wizards, like, if people like these songs, they're going to listen to them while they're playing with with their friends for the rest of their lives, potentially, you know, like, if, if there's a song that really resonates with them, uh, that is an official Magic the Gathering song, uh, like, you know, look at a lot of these other, like, franchise like look at the pokemon theme you know what i mean like right. like everyone in, everyone under the age of 50 probably has the first verse of that song memorized and it's just because you know it, it made an impact with so many of us and and the same goes for you know the songs from star wars a lot of the themes from lord of the rings and and all i mean these... how many covers of the skyrim theme are there right? yeah like, well i've made several right you know yeah, i don't even i've never even played skyrim and i know all the goddamn yeah. songs because they're just omnipresent yeah but yeah no you're absolutely right though because it's it's so wild to sit there and think about how many just things have popped up in trends and popped up in like cultural context 
like i'm curious what my kid is going to even have as his like core memories it's gonna be like masha and the bear versus like some random ala wardy cover music or like yeah peter hollands or something like because yeah since he's been a little kid my son and i have been we, he's been watching his tablet and he watches a lot of you know cover songs and stuff on youtube he's got no idea what the original version of these songs are he's yeah. only got the weird chopped hacked remix versions on his head and i'm like yeah this is such a weird world i love it but yeah like what the hell is going on I didn't mean to get so deeply existential, like right off the top. Oh, like, we can that, we can get very kind of, existential if you want. About, I mean, about you know what, man? That's, art that's, ethics, that's, <laughs> dude. That the like half the time this show is like a place where content creators can come and be like, "God, I love the thing I do, but I hate the thing I do." Oh, and dude, it's not like you know, it's not I, malice. I was going to ask you about that, and th that's mm. honestly that's why I didn't ever start playing magic or arena or anything on Twitch is because yeah. I almost can't even listen to music anymore casually. You know, Dude, I worked in the film industry for a decade. Yeah. Ask me how many movies I watch now. <laughs> Zero. <not>. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Unless my wife is like, we need to go see this. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Like, and I worked before that. I worked in the video games industry and like, I lived in Japan. I came home from Japan, no more anime. Yeah. And I basically stopped playing video games because once once your job become your hobby becomes your job everyone's like oh you'll never work a day in your life no what it means is you'll never have a place to escape to anymore yeah it means that the thing you love is no longer the refuge from the thing that you do yeah and, and, so, and a big yeah. part of that is like um uh your priorities have to shift by necessity because now you have to monetize it because if you if exactly if your job is now to create art then the your your motivation for creating art is no longer because you're excited and and just motivated intrinsically to do it you're excited because you're getting paid to do it and yes. or, or not excited but like you, you have to get paid you have to do it and then because you have to get paid to make the art uh what direction you take the art is is inherently gonna completely change and that's why uh i've been really making a big push in my own music career and with the musicians that I've worked with to try and move towards more unique, um, mm. long lasting and, and creatively fulfilling projects like this Kamigawa soundtrack. Yes. Uh, because you know, it, it's almost like a rite of passage for heavy metal musicians to do, <laughs> to, to, to do a cover of the Skyrim theme. You know what I mean? Like, it's <laughs> like seriously. And, 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 uh, for, for deep voiced singers, Dude, your just... voice is so good, by the way, Thank I you. love your voice. <laughs> Thank you. It's yeah. my... like, I'm a, I'm a big metal fan and yeah. like, I mean, I'm older. So my metal is like Metallica more yeah. than like, you know, yeah. running nails through your dick or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> but I do love me a lot of Emperor and a lot of like Nordic, like, like when Kaldheim came out and they had like all of the Nordic metal bands yeah. come out and do the previews. I was like, yeah, yeah, let's go. So, um, I like what I heard first off the Kamigawa soundtrack. So for those of you who don't know the Kamigawa soundtrack, they, it's entirely bananas to me how much effort Mar Wizards has put into Kamigawa's marketing. Yeah. They did an anime. They got the Attack on Titan guys to do a three minute long anime trailer of the story, which is insane. Yeah. Team France got Hatsune Miku to write a magic song about Kamigawa. Wild. Yeah. And then I'm talking to Light, who's uh, the marketing manager that yep. he's like, yeah, dude, there's a soundtrack coming out. I'm like, what the hell is a magic soundtrack? It's a yeah. card game. And he's like, believe me, you're going to die. And I'm like, yeah. I love synth wave and chill wave and metal. What do you got? And he's like, I can't tell you. And I'm like, I hate you. What do you have? <laughs> um, and then this thing came out and suddenly I'm listening to basically Phantom of the Opera style, like yep. just operatic metal about Kamigawa and then hardcore chill wave in the middle. And I'm like, yep. what is this? I love every second of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a weebs and I've lived in Japan. So like <laughs> hearing shamisens and hearing like, you know, the weird like Japanese like lyrics and stuff like, yeah. you know, Tasukete, and I'm like, yeah, let's go. So it was, awesome. sweet. it was sweet. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm so happy you, you liked it. Man. <laughs> we, we put a lot of work into it. And um, what was amazing about this project uh, that I've mentioned a little bit over the past weeks is that um, it was completely done by independent musicians. Um, which is pretty much unheard of yeah, for something like this. Like mm, yeah. normally when, when a company does some kind of a soundtrack or a song, 
to promote their franchise, normally they will they basically, uh, yeah, that, well, they'll, they'll commission, they'll hand pick a team to, to make the song and it, there will be rigorous screening of every step of the way to make sure that the song is exactly the right oh, yeah. vibe that, that, on that message company and... wants. Yeah. And, all, and, and, and that's not to say that, that we didn't do some screening with, with Wizards of the Coast for the Kamigawa <laughs> soundtrack, but, um, but a lot of the, the, the songs on the album were, uh, I, I guess a better way to put it is that what, what a lot of people don't know is that like, uh, movie directors, you might know this if you worked in the film yeah. industry, movie directors, when they have like a, a an idea in mind for like, you know, Iron Man's epic entrance yeah. theme, or the, uh, that's an orchestral theme, or, right. or when, when, a, when a Hollywood producer wants a certain type of music for a trailer for one of these superhero mm -hmm. movies or something, a lot of times they'll find someone like me, a composer or a producer, and they'll send us, um, they'll send us a song that is like a temp song that they've been using mm -hmm. as a, as a placeholder in the trailer and make then, it sound like this. And they'll literally say, make it sound like this. And, and you're rigidly locked in to making something that, that sounds exactly like that. So, and with this, some of these independent artists that we brought in to do a lot of, uh, especially the, the more instrumental, uh, chill tracks on the album. Um, we basically said, make a song about Kamigawa, think about synth wave, think about, you know, uh, science fantasy, think about magic, look at some of this art and, and have fun. And they, oh God, I love that so much. They slayed it. And, and it's, I can't understate how incredible uh, how incredible it is that wizards of the coast trusted those yes. musicians to do that because that is definitely not something watsi would have done t five ten years ago their their entire um i guess drive has changed their entire like kind of motivation in terms of what they want out of this set or what they want out of their marketing efforts they're yeah. way freer than they would have been uh in a previous iteration and it's funny you mentioned that because one of the things jobs I used to have was cutting trailers for Sony PlayStation games. Yeah. And like they would put out like, you know, an Uncharted or something like that. And I'd be working on it and I would, you know, get the footage, cut it. And they would give us like, you know, some real very big expensive, like, you know, Black Sabbath, Iron Man, cut yeah. the footage to this song, make the beats match. And then they're like, we can't afford the license. So you need to go find a musician to make not iron man yeah <laughs> and then like find somebody who can give us the same kind of and they have and i'm like here's my trailer here's the song make me a song that will boom at the right places and yeah. it it's real rough on the musician it's hard to do that. and that kind of work pays like crap yeah absolute crap a musician who does something like that will get paid a few hundred or a few thousand dollars if they're lucky and it's a one-time fee you mm. get in and get out you make diet black sab or yeah yeah, basically. yeah diet black sabbath because <laughs> um <laughs> because that's what the hollywood producer wanted and and you know nobody knows who you are it's just the song from the trailer mm -hmm. and in many ways this kamigawa soundtrack is completely flipped like this, yeah the script is completely backwards compared so to the can we pull back a step and i would love yeah. to know i mean i'm really interested in your magic career and i'm really interested in your music but i would really like to know more importantly how did you get approached for this kamigawa thing what did they tell you when they came here and how did they set this project up for you so i kind of approached them to be oh, honest sweet. uh and well i mean i pitched it to them and what? i was i was able to i and you know i don't want to like that sounds a lot crazier than it actually was. That makes it sound like <laughs> I, I went to Wizards of the Coast CEO's office and knocked <laughs> on his door. Like that's not what happened. But um, but the reason why it happened the way it did is because I did the Kaldheim song. Yeah, and broken bow. Yeah. So um, as I understand it, and this is a lot of this is hearsay because I don't act. I, I don't know how the the actual pipeline works and full disclosure I'm, I'm not an employee of wizards of the coast i'm an independent musician um who has worked for wizards of the coast sure. um but uh what i understand happened is that wizards 
outsourced some of the marketing to a European branch or something mm -hmm. for Kaldheim. And that was the company that came up with this uh, metal musician idea for Kaldheim because mm. uh, uh, Scandinavia has such a rich history of, of uh, like a Viking themed metal music. Um, and a friend of mine, Pelike, who's another singer on YouTube, uh, is one of the most well-connected and well-respected singers in the entire Norwegian metal scene. And I taught him how to play magic. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I taught him how to play magic about a week before this, uh, this company approached him to be one of the people to make uh, a Kaldheim metal song. So he was gracious enough to be like, look, I would love to make a song for magic, the gathering, but you got to let me do it with Jonathan because he taught me how to play. That's um, sweet. So we made that song. Uh, we made a song about Arnie broken brow. Who's one of the, uh, the legendary the coolest creatures. Legends in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> total yeah. badass. One of the, one of the legendary creatures from, uh, and it was, it was such a like open, it was like, okay, we want you to make a song about Arnie broken brow. Go. <laughs> and and uh and we we had like a we had like a web fiction so we made like this adventure song where it's like singing about you know kind of mm. like a, a bard song but in the context of viking metal it was so much fun to make uh mm. pelican and i had a great time and um and we put it out and m my understanding of what happened is that uh wizards just like was blindsided because they Hell like yeah, they, they like hadn't thought about like oh like these musicians that are just doing this little sponsorship for us are gonna make something that's crazy uh yeah. with like a real music video and a, and a you know super <laughs> well-produced song um so i heard uh basically i heard that like that music video for the broken brow song was floating around the the wizard's offices and Gavin commented on my video. Um, and that's how I met Gavin is because he <laughs> he saw my Broken Brow cover and I had already been watching Good Morning Magic for for a long time at that point. Um, so I was a huge fan of Gavin and Gavin came to my video and he was like, oh, my gosh, this is so cool. This is I'd never imagined that there would be a, an actual metal song about Magic the Gathering. And I messaged him and I was like, yo, let's play some games. And it's funny, yeah. you, you can you can ask Gavin about this because Gavin, I think Gavin thought that I was like just some random singer yeah. who like maybe played a little bit of arena. Yeah, but you don't understand. Gavin <laughs> will go anywhere to play magic with anyone. Yeah, who yeah. So <laughs> yeah, Gavin was like, oh, yeah, I would love to play. Something he came to my sometime. house. <laughs> uh, so, so he was like, oh, well, what, you know, what format do you want to play? And I sent him a picture of my my rotating cd case that has 50 <laughs> decks on it and i was like what format do you want to play gavin <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how we met and um so i that was a long convoluted story how long have you but, been into magic uh original theros nice um good set and i should have been into it sooner because I had uh, friends in high school who played a lot, but I didn't get into it until after college. Uh, but um, yeah, so anyway, so Gavin was, uh, so I was playing some games with Gavin and I kind of kept poking Gavin like, look, I could do an album, but it has to get green light lit, you know, like th th it would be very, very like a lot simpler than Wizards realizes to assemble the musicians to do this mm. and 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 do a really solid job and all we need to do is explain the idea um so i i wrote up a pitch and i was like look we 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 find some independent musicians we give them all a song just like we did with the caldime thing uh that kind of was an accidental smash hit and um and yeah that's how it happened but See, yeah I mean, it's amazing because one thing, Gavin is like the grease for so many different wheels at Magic. I mean, like when it comes to like actually interfacing with Watsi, if you go through him, it's amazing the weird things that can happen and get done. Uh, and I can't even talk about all of them. But um, <laughs> it's it's just it's nuts because like this is so out of character for uh, Magic, right? Like 
just that's why they were all stunned like oh my god it's a real song you yeah. think about it, a lot of their content that they get is you know folks like me or folks like prof or whatever we make videos we do free content we do fun things but it's different than when like and there's been songs about magic before but they've been all kind of more amateur more like kind of low-key it's i think they're starting to realize that a lot of people play magic and some of them happen to be professionals with real careers that do real things and when you guys apply your real work to this it becomes way cool. Yeah. And, well, and I think that, you know, to, to Wizards credit, I think that uh, the entertainment industry is, has been changing so fast. Mm. And um, I think that this, this, I mean, you know, because I'm a fan too, you know, like obviously mm. like, I like, and, um, and I, I, I've been following, you know, the through line of, of, of wizard's journey as a company for you know since 2013 i've been paying very close attention mm -hmm. to, to everything that's been going on and i think that the fact that uh you know i mean i don't want to you know, like whatever toot my own horn or anything but i think the fact that they were able to trust some random independent musicians on the internet to do this i think is a really good sign yes of, of what's to come and mm -hmm. i think that um that everybody should be excited about uh how much the wizards marketing team absolutely killed it on this comic oh my stuff. god it's insane yeah because they're not gonna slow down like the, I, the i'm so excited the, for everything that's coming the people that i've met on the wizards team who are coming up with these ideas for how to to take each of these sets to the next level uh like light like uh rachel uh annie rachel is one of my um, dearest friends yeah rachel's amazing uh i spoke with rachel a lot about getting this project on board and annie uh mm. who was uh my personal representative and, and my mm. my go-between with wizards during this project was an absolute uh an absolute hero on this project and and uh basically um it, it was so smooth to to work on this project because annie was just handling everything on the company side and i was handling everything on the music production side and we just got it done just they give you a very free hand to do this huh well because like it's the the album itself is like it's like half instrumentals and then half rock opera which is like really cool and unique i and think i think the the thing that the, i guess the context for that is that um in many ways, this was an influencer marketing promotion mm. for the company. You know, in, in many Absolutely. ways, this was about getting these singers who have millions of fans to, to talk about magic on their YouTube 100%. channels, much in the same way that they would, you know, get get a famous actor sure. uh, or, or somebody to uh, or somebody who's Twitter famous or whatever to, to post about magic. Uh, so <laughs> in, in many ways, this is like a win, 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 win situation because the musicians are absolutely awestruck that a company like wizards is reaching out to them and working with them. Wizards is incredibly excited to be working with these influencers that have yes. such large followings. Audiences. Yeah. And the fans are excited. We get music. Because, it's red. Yeah. We all get, yeah. Everybody wins. We get music. Wizards gets promotion. The musicians get exposure and, and, um, and, job you know work <laughs> you work exactly yeah so i would like to talk about the album specifically now because i know we've been kind of beating around the bush a bit and yeah. it's mainly i'm sorry about that i just oh, no, wanted no, no. more of your interest because you're cool i want to know about you <laughs> thank you uh, but um so are you <laughs> but, like i find it like I would, so i was listening to the album and your voice was cool and i was listening i'm like okay i get it and then i heard the trivium guy yeah and i'm like wait i know this voice yep and I'm like, how does that, like Matt Heafy of, of the band Trivium, one of the like classic real just metal bands out there, not real. I mean, I don't mean real, but I mean like, oh yeah, big name. Like well, I knew they, them I mean, before. They, yeah. Of, like they've been opening for Metallica since like what, 2010 or something. Yeah. So I've seen Metallica like 18 times. So I've seen Trivium live a bunch too. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm like, damn, that's a real, that's like, there's levels of influencer and there's levels of budget that i understand wizards has yeah and i'm like i would have thought that some of these people were out of their range you know I, that's, that sort of thing so here's here's the thing about that and I, i'm not, I, I don't want to like and i don't mean like i don't want to get financial yeah but I'm just yeah like, Damn, I, you got something I'm, awesome on this i'm not gonna dive too deep into that but um 
I think that there's a disconnect between like so-called influencers and how like personality driven influencers work and mm. when like when they accept jobs and when they don't accept jobs and i think that that genre of content creator is very very different than mm. than than the independent musicians of the internet mm. and um because of the way that music rights and music royalties work um listening to the music actually supports the musicians that made the music and that's another way that they are getting compensated is from the actual um the you know the fans that are listening to the music uh so it's not like it's not like a raid shadow legend sponsorship where the company you know uh or or, or nord vpn like it's oh not God. like that where like you know i have a million subscribers nord vpn pay, pays me fifteen thousand dollars to talk about nord vpn for 45 seconds at the beginning of the video it's yeah. not like that like we're not just making marketing we're making something that is also going to be a matt heafy original song and he yes. he's making original songs anyway so why not just you know swerve into this interesting musical direction of like synth wave vapor wave kind of uh you know influenced yeah. music just you know for a week or two and 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 if you're already making music every single day just make music that's a little bit different for a week or two and get you know get to work with one of the most iconic fantasy strategy games in history and is he from was he familiar with magic yeah he played growing up uh That's wild yeah he hasn't played in a while but i was talking with him about it and he was like oh yeah i played in the 90s i was like dude you so like I, find your cards find your cards yeah, go I, to your mom's house get them dude, back please i told him i was like bro find your cards because if you have some lands from from right? the 90s like oh don't don't remind me of the lands that i don't have from oh, the 90s when i played man. Um, we all have that story uh but yeah so can you tell me so wizards come to you they give you the project you're like all right or you guys however it is you end up with this project what did you do how did you decide to like i mean how did you plan this i guess what was your immediate thought when you were like okay did, like how did you know it was Kamigawa and did they tell you in the first place or were you just like the next set yeah, you do I want to make a soundtrack for? Yeah, they they told me. They were like, "Okay, we're going to do this and we're going to do it for Kamigawa." Mm. And um and immediately uh I started getting ideas for people that I wanted to hit up to mm. to do that. And and when they told me that it was uh well, I suppose by the time they told me it was Kamigawa, I already knew that it was neon dynasty and i already knew about the the time sure, jump sure, sure. in the lore so i knew it was going to be like kind of cyberpunk synth wave um and just like how i'm sure that any content creator has you know a, a rolodex of yeah tons and tons of people that are adjacent to you that you speak mm -hmm. with like i'm sure that you have recurring guests on your on your show that gavin for instance yeah, yeah like gavin i talked to him um, just this morning yeah uh, so yeah. Uh, a lot of the people that were on this album were kind of people like that who were kind of in my Rolodex of musicians sure. that I that I work with a lot or that I've I've um, looked up to in the past. Um, so I knew that if we're looking for music that is influenced by this Japanese folklore, if we're mm. looking for electronic music specifically, here are some different people that we can reach out to to accomplish those two things. And I also started doing my homework about um how I can mix and produce electronic beats, which I, I knew how to do in concept, but uh, kind of like learning a different Magic the Gathering format, like yeah. the, the, the rules of mixing and the rules of composing and arranging music are always the same, yes. but you have to learn different like rule sets for well, each. Well, yeah, because like, I mean, Western pop music and Western electronic music all have this, there's a... Th People are like, oh yeah, it's wild and free. I'm like, no, there's a very strong structure oh, yeah. to Western music. You've got a rhythm, four to the floor, or some variant thereof, one of the many rhythms we've got. Yeah. But like it's there are rules to how to make electronic music, how to make synthwave music, how to make metal music. Yeah. And if you know the formula, you can plug in within that rule set and adapt it to what you want. Yeah, music is just math. Music is just pattern recognition and math. And if you 
um, if you learn the language of music, I mean, it's kind of like a language too, right? Yep. Like it's, it's, if you learn the grammar and you learn, um, what words to use in which situation, like there's going to be some situations and some places where you're going to use certain sentences. Like if you're writing an essay, you're going to use different sure. sent sentence structure and different word choice than you would if you were hanging out with the boys at a, at a bar, you know, and there's and, like, you know, when you make a music phrase, there's another phrase that'll follow and yes. you know how to make it not discordant, how to actually make, right. you should talk to, if you haven't, you need to talk to Sam. Uh, the Magic Man Ristic Studies. Oh, I love um, Ristic Studies. I would yeah, love to talk with him. He's a like he's a bass player and a guitarist. Oh, and, no way. Yeah, he does. I like, didn't every know now, that. Every now and then he'll just throw up like, here I just spent like twelve minutes and here's this like incredible solo that I'm just going to play for you right now. Oh man, I, he's I need to talk to Sam. Good. I've been yeah. watching Sam's videos for years and I he, did not know that he was a musician. So. He's he's like guitars are his like not magic thing. Yeah. So he's a huge, I mean, and you, he's, I think would, he's yeah. so intelligent and analytical about like the magic stuff, at least yeah. when he's, when his video essays well, about that. His, his motive is like art and like, cause he's a PhD in like, you know, in Italian arts and literature and oh, culture. Wow. And so he looks at things in a means of deconstructing the art to understand the motivation and the, yeah. and, uh, the context. And he does have a music too. And like, that's I the think you would actually get along with it really well. Yeah, that's the, <clears throat> like I I don't listen to music. I I deconstruct music. You yeah, know? I mean, yeah, like I'm a big fan of, for instance, Indian classical music, oh, and yeah. India because I'm I'm from North India. That's my you know heritage and stuff. And Indian classical music uses like thirteen beat rhythms and eighteen yeah. beat rhythms, and then you're like, how do you even count? Yeah, what's going on? And it's incredibly cool <clears throat> to hear like you know, the, the sitarist or the singer is going one way, the tabla player is going another way, but every so often they will meet back up yep, and the they'll just be like, and the phrase will hit yeah. and you'll be like, Oh, that was sick. Yeah. Cause but, of the, the math, it lines yeah. up like the, you know, and, the, the, you're counting 13 beats here and, and four beats here or whatever. Yeah, and, and it's just like after a certain number of, of iterations, they meet it, back up again. And yeah. when it does, you're like, Oh shit. Yeah, you know, it drops hard. It drops yeah, hard. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Do you listen I'm, to Bloody Wood? Bloody Wood is rad. I love Bloody Wood. Bloody Wood is rad. Oh, oh my God, dude. I, you know what? Afterwards, I'm going to send you some links to some Coke Studio stuff, which if Do you it. haven't heard of, have you heard of Coke Studio? I haven't. So in India and Pakistan, Coca-Cola of all companies in the world went and said, you know what would be cool? If we took all of these like poor rural folk singers and like Kawali singers and religious singers, and then oh. gave them a bunch of like modern electronic and rock musicians to work That's with. That's so cool. And then they're like, Hey man, let's take your 13 minute long, like, you know, noodling and set it to like a hardcore drop beat. And you're yeah. like, this is the sickest thing I've ever heard. That's Anyways, so I'll cool. send you. It's, it's amazing. I think you'll really dig it. Yeah. And it's, it's so interesting. Like, yeah, I would love to talk with Sam and yeah. I could, I could talk about this with any, anybody who oh, dude, wants to. I love music so much. Yeah. Because um, it's, I mean, just like when you see Sam's, uh, Ristic studies videos about, um, you know, the, the motivation behind a lot of the art in a lot yeah. of these magic cards and, and the context of why the art e evokes a certain emotion yes. and, and why it feels like a certain culture or a certain mythology or, or, you know, those right. recognizing those through lines, the same is true of music, but I've spoken with a lot of musicians about how, um, because music isn't a visual art form, mm. it, it's, there's this strange stigma where most consumers, uh, consumers is a bad word. I don't want to use that word. Most, uh, listeners, most mm. people who, who love music, um, they aren't as cognizant and and consciously aware of the patterns and the formulas mm -hmm. of music as they are of visual art because you, you you have to train your brain to kind of use your ears and recognize shapes and and yeah. and, and colors and textures <laughs> with your ears the same way as you do with your eyes and it's so difficult to do that that what you end up having is you end up having uh people that think that they know how music uh you know culture and context and and analytical deconstruction works 
but really they just like certain things and don't like other things and they just they don't well, yeah, know how any like, of it works you know there's a human need for like pattern and for like consistency and for structure and for bounce yeah and like like when you listen to eminem's lose yourself which is one of my favorite just songs to like deconstruct music yeah. because it's one of the greatest like modern songs written of just in terms of his rhyming capability, his internal structure and his beat and his rhythm. And you listen to the way he bounces and the way he holds certain notes over the beat so that it stretches into the next verse. And it's like, those are the things that catch you and keep you going, keep you driving. And so yeah. people are like, yeah, man, it's just a catchy song. It's a nice earworm. I'm like, yeah, but do you understand the tricks? Yeah, but why? Here? Yeah, like, why is it catchy? What what does it mean to be catchy? Because with visual art, a lot of people can say this art looks good because of the contrast, because of the color dynamics, because of the light and the shadow and the, yeah. the, the composition and the places where all of these visual elements are. A lot of people can point at a painting, and even if they're not an art critic or or an art historian or or, or an art connoisseur or whatever, they can still kind of point at a painting painting and 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 understand what's going on because human visual acuity is so good that we can pick up on those patterns and and follow along with those patterns but if i you know if i try to get you to follow along with like why does celtic music use a sharp sixth mm. and and why does that always make it sound like scandinavian folk music to the average listener like a lot of listeners would kind of be like what I thought that mm. music was just about the soul, you know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, it's the same way when you look at like jazz, like yeah. if you look at like a free jazz, like, and you're listening to it. And if you don't know what you're listening to, it sounds like an elephant ran into traffic, right? You're just yeah. like, what is this weird cacophony? But then once you understand the rules that they're working in and the rag that they're working in, the framework yeah. that they're working in, and suddenly it's like, oh no, this guy is insanely yeah. skilled. Like I was watching a video of Buddy Rich, one of the greatest like drummers oh, yeah. of the modern era. Oh yeah. And dude is just tearing up these drums and you're listening to it. It's like in 1950, this must have ripped people's faces off. Yeah. Because yeah. like, how do you it's never it's been like done? A Gatling gun. It's like, what it was like, on? it was like Van Halen in the eighties. Yeah, right? It's like nobody, had, eruption nobody had like, ever done that man. before, you know? And yeah, it's like, I mean, jazz is like, or like Skrillex, yeah, Even Skrillex, yeah, just blowing my mind. I love dubstep more than like, <laughs> more than I should admit, but I love that twisty distort. Anyway, yeah. well, because all music is 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 uh, tension and release, conflict and resolution. You're hearing patterns that represent rising tension, and then a resolution to that tension and and that's how dubstep works that's how metal works that's how jazz works all and and when you don't get that resolution oh it's so annoying yeah so <laughs> and, and and musician in the same way that if if a, if a movie ends with the main character dying or if a painting looks like it doesn't have any you know peace or 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 any resolution in any part of the painting it it pulls on your your emotions in a weird way and uh and if you can learn the patterns of music and replicate them uh it's it's incredibly rewarding to be able to 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 slip into all of these different styles and and uh and genres and know like you know, I'm going to play this sequence of notes and I know that the listener is going to be pissed off that I didn't, you know, <laughs> that I didn't resolve it. But that's part of it. The part of it is that this is supposed to sound frustrating or it's yes. supposed to sound bitter. And um, anyway. I love when people do that with music, when you're like, like one of my favorite genres of music is when people take songs that are written in a major key or in one key and then just be like, now we're going to do this in minor key. Yeah. And suddenly it's going to become a tortured song of sadness and you yeah. don't know why. And, and I love and, it. So and much. that's all just math. That's all yeah. just the physics of, of changing one time. It's one note. Usually it's, oh, yeah. the, it's the third, it's the third note of whatever key you're in determines whether or not it's a mm -hmm. major, uh, a Western major scale. Da, da, or... da, into, da, da, da. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, and only changing that one note throughout the song and sometimes the seventh or, or the sixth, uh, your brain immediately registers it as sad, whether you like it or not. And that's, that's not magic. Or I mean, literal <laughs> magic. Not, that's a, you know, that's that's illusion. A, yeah, that's 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 not like some trick. That's like the actual physics of how those sound waves are interacting and how your brain is reading 
the 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 dissonance between those sound waves i take it you went to college for music theory i dropped out of college for music theory but yes <laughs> but you took some classes and they stuck yes, with you. yes. what do you play uh yes <laughs> i'm a big fan of yes. yeah i i play um i play piano is what i consider my main instrument but mm. drums was my first instrument and i can fake playing guitar well enough that most people think that i'm a of, that's a, awesome. A, a very good guitarist. <laughs> I could play trombone, harmoniums, and a synthesizer. Like, nice. and like, I've got this awesome old school synth that I can just yeah, make and loops, and loops with. I love yeah. it. But um, and I I want to learn accordion really badly. I have an accordion over there because I think like Indian classical music would sound sick on an accordion. That is but, such um, a good idea. It would be wild. I love I mean, it, dude. There's this guy named uh, Vishwa Mohan Bhatt, who's a famous guitarist in India. He took a Hawaiian slide guitar, added like 16 more strings to it, and called it a Mohan Veena. Wow. And so now he plays Indian slide guitar, and it is... I'm going to send you a video after this. It is the sickest thing you've heard. It's That's so, so good. cool. It's so cool. But um, sorry, I, I get real... Oh, don't worry about it. Um, okay, well, I want, let's talk about the actual songs now. Yeah. Um, so... Can you explain what a producer is for music? That's an amazing question. So uh, the word producer has gone through some changes over the past 10, 15 years in the music world. Traditionally, in the old school music world, in the record label, you know, uh, mm. Hollywood, Los Angeles music world, a producer is kind of like a movie producer. It's the person yeah. who's overseeing the project. It's the person who's kind of uh, keeping everybody focused on the right creative the direction. Uh, yeah, that as well. Um, but it, it would kind of be like the George Lucas, the Steven Spielberg of the project. And, you know, Steven Spielberg isn't necessarily the one that's turning on the camera. He's not necessarily the one that's editing the movie, but he's the one that's kind of, uh, pushing the project forward. Uh, and that's what it was in, in the, in the old world. And mm. that's kind of more accurate to what I did on the entirety of the Kamigawa soundtrack. Um, but it, more recently the word producer has kind of been twisted so that now, uh, producer is used to, to denote like five different jobs. Mm. Uh, so there's the, the producer and then there's the mixing engineer who's mixing the song, which I also did, uh, uh, I think, about uh, a third or, or almost half of this album I mixed myself. Uh, and then there's the mastering engineer who masters the album, which is an entirely separate can of worms. And then there's um, the arranging and the composition, which if it's a beat, oftentimes the music producer is also the composer and the arranger mm. of that beat but in the old music entertainment world composers and arrangers were separate people both yeah. of them wrote the song but it, so the composer would be the person who decides what notes to play and the arranger in a, in a manner of speaking would be the person who decides what style those notes are played in and what instruments those notes are played on so in the modern world a producer actually takes on five different traditional music industry jobs. And mm. I, I did some of that on this uh, project. Um, so like when you refer to like Skrillex as a music producer, he's doing like five different things himself. He's mixing, mm. he's mastering. Oftentimes uh, he's making the beat or arranging or composing in the traditional sense. Uh, and then he's also the one who's creatively directing the song. Um, or like someone like Pharrell or Timbaland who's sitting right. there and I'm actually making a beat and you're going to rap over it. I it's almost like they're composing the songs themselves and then also doing the technical aspect of putting the song together. Right. So that's rad. So if you're the main producer of this, but you went out and you farmed out these tracks to, or not farmed out, but you went out and got independent musicians and folks to actually write these songs, which means you weren't exactly like, you know, you're not composing the, their songs for them. So did you like you gave some them assignments them and they would come back to you? Or? Some of them. So the um, uh, well, I know that you wrote the songs with uh, Matt Heafy. I uh, Heafy and I wrote uh, most of our songs together. Uh, so Heafy and I tag teamed the songwriting and the. What was that like? Was that rad? It was awesome. It was. I mean, it it was crazy though because it was so fast. Like he would send me 
he would send me a guitar part and then I would put drums on it and send it back to him. And, um, ooh, ooh, ooh. okay. That, that's a question I was trying to get to. Yeah. Yeah. When you are making a song, I know that there's some artists who like to start with lyrics and then say, okay, we'll find a way to make music for this. And then there's some artists who are like, I've got this rad riff. Can we figure out what this would say? How did you approach that with this album? So it, it depends on what the purpose of the song is and what, mm. like what direction you're taking it. I mean, it would be no different than building a, building a magic deck, right? Like right. You, you might, you might build a deck around a commander or you might build a deck around, you know, a, a, some random, you know, some yeah. random combo or something inside of the the ninety nine or whatever. Um, and the same is true with like these songs. Uh, so, like for example, uh, when they sent me the web fiction about Tamio becoming yes. a, a Phyrexian, I oh am, god, your stream of Tamio is so yeah, good. I immediately knew as soon as I read that last line, the <laughs> epilogue in the web fiction. I was like, I'm writing a song about Tamio. I'm doing the lyrics right now. Like I, I'm doing this, and I started with like kind of writing these lyrics as I started to contextualize music underneath it. Uh, but on the flip side, uh, a lot of these songs that I did with Matt Heafy, we would start with like a guitar idea and then we mm. would just build and build and build and add drums and add more guitar ideas expanding off of that. And then we would write vocals on top of it. So it, it like, there's not really a right or wrong way to do it. Sure. Um, uh, w- when the lyrics are supposed to be central I'll usually start by writing the music and lyrics for the chorus and mm. then I'll build out from there. And I think that if you're writing a song that's supposed to be like a pop song, uh, I think that's usually the place to start. Uh, but if you're, if you're writing a song that's like more like groove driven or more um, idea driven front, like front musically idea driven uh, I think it can sometimes be better to start with just some noodling. Um <laughs> Man, that Tomio song. First off, that Tomio <laughs> story. Tell me that wasn't crushing. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then just writing a song about her becoming Phyrexian is like salt in the wound. Yeah. But also so cool. And, you know, I I knew that I, like, because I, I knew I was going to pick one song that was going to be the one that I sang on, mm. on, on the project. And as soon as I saw that, because that's m- part of my shtick as a content creator is that I have a deep, dark and spooky voice. And uh, yes, so I immediately knew I was like, I have to sing this dark It's funny because like song. just today I cracked oh, the Phyrexian Tamio. Man, <laughs> I got to get me some of those because I'm I, I've mentioned this before when I w- was announcing the project, but I'm the salt eye guy at my LGS. I, <laughs> dude, I when they when they spoiled Oko. I went to my LGS. I was like, this is going to be the best card ever printed. I want five play sets of them. I'm going to get the full, the foil full arts and I'm, I'm going to put them in every deck. <laughs> and and everybody was like, everybody was like, John, you're crazy. These food tokens are stupid. This card is not going to be that good. And, but because I was, I was playing, <laughs> I, dude, I was playing salt eye super friends in modern, like, since 2017 or something i was <laughs> n- the only deck i played was salt eye super friends in modern and uh if there was ever a card made for salt eye goddamn yeah. super friends it's oko <laughs> yeah and but then so then like you know i i know that tamio's a a, a simic planeswalker and i know that she's about to become a phyrexian as part of this story and I'm the salt eye planeswalker guy. I'm like, this is fate. I have to sing this. I have to write this song. <laughs> so, God damn, man. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, writing writing the songs on the album are like, you know, it was so much fun writing those songs. Like um, a lot of the lyrics that I wrote for the album are like super lighthearted. Because, um, I, you know, I really wanted to kind of do justice to the fact that like, there there's kids of all ages playing magic so which is tough because like when you think about electronic music and edm when are you usually listening to that music like four in the morning yeah you're like at a club i have definitely been to some raves in the mud before let me tell you so like it's you know it's kind of different because like you don't want to make like rave music lyrics for like a card game that's supposed to be for all ages. You know what I mean? So, um, 
unless uh, unless Tommy has been uh, hitting the plant rather yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. The, oh man, <laughs> she's been uh, modified. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All those uh, the the Phyrexian machines. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. So um, so you know, I mean, a lot of the um, and the company wanted to make sure that that these songs were like positive and 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 like optimistic you know yeah because um, i mean kamigawa's whole vibe is yeah even though all this dark nonsense is happening it's still a uplifting ish set yeah. somehow so I mean, and i think that it was a really fun challenge to write a lot of the lyrics um because i think a lot of lyricists have fallbacks like, like i could talk for hours about lyric writing because like a lot of lyric writers will kind of like I'll win the fight tonight. I'll make it right. It's, you know, uh, it's, they'll kind of like uh, see the light. They'll, they'll kind of just like do the same like pattern and they'll just like, you know, uh, they won't try to sing about any complex themes. They'll just kind of sing about the same generic, like generic in internal conflict song number 50. Uh, and so I really wanted to try and make some, <laughs> some specific lyrics about um something that like a lot of kids who are excited to play magic would would jam out to mm. um but yeah i really you know the song that grabbed me randomly was it the one that felt kind of almost the most out of character for the album neon streets like yeah the, the pop song basically. i wrote that one yeah yeah I, i'm looking at the credits i can see that it's just it's like it's so it feels like an anime song yeah it feels like it's got the tone structure and like like it feels like an anime intro but in english yeah and, and i'm like this is rad. it's a little cheesy but it's it kinda, a little it, cheesy it, but it, it kind of works you know it's yeah. kind of it's kind of like it's it's i don't know i i think it's fun because it's like we're not trying to make a a you know we're not making a billy eilish song we're not no. making a we're not making a post malone song here we're making a song about this fantasy world like let's just have some fun and you know yeah sing about this this cyberpunk fantasy city it's just it's it's very like warming it it makes you feel optimistic it's hopeful it is a little like when i was 18 i would have been all over this type right. of thing right <laughs> right but it's fine I, yeah I, that's rad though yeah but like i loved Toskete. i loved uh like I don't know. Hefe's voice is rad. Yeah, and Hefe brought a lot of like the darker adult sort of lyrics um, w when when we were writing together. Because I, you know, I'm when I get an interesting challenge, like write lyrics for Magic: The Gathering, I kind of like steer very hard in that direction, and uh, and like I was working on a song about like literal mechs fighting each other like it was going to be like a funny like <laughs> like kind of quirky song about like like you know like <laughs> almost like a almost like a tenacious d kind of a oh, thing God. you know uh so mm. i i kind of like go into left field a lot with my lyrics when i'm like when i i'm set to a specific task of like you're you're writing lyrics about kamigawa uh and and hefe kind of like pulled it back uh back into like i guess the more adult um, more like real world grounded kind of right because hefe didn't come into it like i did with all of this background knowledge of, of kamigawa and and the you know the context of magic the gathering culturally and 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 because i mean community. it is a little strange to like sing songs about like lore things in lore world, right. right but like it's also strange to not do that. You no, know what it would I mean? have been completely like, weird so, to not have so, any references. Uh, I think that having Hefe on this project was amazing because uh, I think that all of the all of the lyric songs, except uh, "Path to Victory," were written by either Hefe or myself. Mm. Um, and uh, Hefe came into this project with such a deep background knowledge of the actual Japanese folklore that the kamigawa setting is based on so he wrote all of these lyrics about like internal struggle and these like japanese sort of parables about like uh like the koi fish becoming the dragon through mm. the like like swimming up the mountain to the dragon's gate or something which is like this like 
uh, integral Japanese folktale or something. Yeah. Uh, and it was so cool that he immediately, like he was so ready to just start writing I like these. He was wait- I mean, his new band is called Ibaraki, yeah. which is the prefecture I lived in when I was yeah. in Japan. And like, you could tell he's been just like chomping at the bit to explore this half of his life. Yeah. And, and I was like, it seems so bad. he like, he just immediately went at it. Like I would, I would like make a drum beat for him and he would send me like half of the lyrics the next day. Uh, <laughs> so we, we worked really fast together and I'm, I'm hoping to get to work with, uh, he a lot more in the future. Um, but I mean, the other thing is that like to, to kind of piggybacking off of what I, what I said earlier, like that doesn't happen ever. Like normally when you're writing a song or something for for a company or for a band you're jumping through a ton of different hoops to before those lyrics go across the finish line so the fact that hefe and i would be like okay we're writing a song today and it's going to be about you know the Tascate. it's going to be about like you know uh, being help lost me. in this yeah help yeah. me and being lost in this world and and uh and and uh, time the times have changed and you you don't know what's going on anymore uh like today we're doing it today I, I, here's the drum beat here's the guitar part here's the lyrics we're sending it off to the company there we go <laughs> that's <laughs> and it's I mean, crazy it's, a that's professional but b that's insane yeah i mean <laughs> but it was fun i mean it didn't feel like work it was like i mean i guess if you're like keyed in and you guys are like locked yeah. into this then it can it's flyby, right? Like, yeah. And you guys are musicians you know how to make music yeah and if you've got an idea in your head you can probably just rock it man I love it. I love this album. The, it's so, I think you, the, one of the things I don't think anybody's talked about that is really good is the track order. I think you did a fantastic job. That was the marketing team and Annie who decided the track order. Cause that <laughs> and is, they did so well. Dude, uh, it's, I think it's it was an underrated just Annie form, actually. Man. I think it was just my, uh, my influencer marketing rep. You think that you just sent her a parcel of tracks and she put them in? Well, because I don't think that she, I don't think that she like got in a call with anybody else about the track order. I think that like because we, I mean, she knew what the songs were going to be, and I because I remember I sent her suggestions about I think that "Light It Up" should be the first song because it feels like the you know opening the the opener the anime opening of of the 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 album and um. I had uh, I had a couple other suggestions. I I I thought that we should get the Tamio song like kind of get that out of your system early on in the album so that that kind of darkness is is gone and you you, <laughs> you kind of spend the rest of the album getting hyped on getting uh, back up the track, yeah. Yeah, cuz that's a big like oof, you know, when that that song kind of is really dark and and um and that was kind of a uh, we were worried that that song was going to be too dark. So I'm really glad that people liked it, but, um, yeah. So we, you know, we, I had some other suggestions, like I wanted to make sure that the instrumental songs were spaced yes. throughout the album. So I suggested that we do that. And, uh, I also wanted to make sure that the songs that were heavily influenced by Hefe's trivium background were spaced because we didn't want like a clump a of five of guitar songs. Um, and then well, I mean, because there's know. an art to that. There's an art to arranging an album to give, because what you're doing is you're giving the listener an emotional ride, yeah. And you're giving them this high, this low. You're giving this contrast, and you want to make sure that each song flows, but is also not like so flowy that you lose the separation yeah. between tracks. And there is a real skill to being able to manipulate that and get them coming out feeling whatever you want them to feel right yeah we we so, talked about that a lot i think it was lovely the d- way it was put together thank you so much we we talked about that a lot and we were really really putting a lot of care into making sure that the the album felt cohesive which was tough because there's all these different independent musicians that come from all the way over in metal versus all the way over in literally ambient or dubstep electronic music and how do we make all of that cohesive um but you know, give, oh, excuse me. Whew. <laughs> I, my piano's on. That was <laughs> big surprise. I mean, if you want to play something, hit me. But, <laughs> like uh, I'm, I'm here to listen. Uh, <laughs> but the thing that was, that was rad, though, um, 
Man, that piano tune just knocked whatever thought I had. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> this is okay, my you know, this is my audio setup for streaming, so I have like my piano plugged in and everything. And and yeah, uh, that's sweet though. That's so cool. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you. I think the reaction has been amazing. I think for what do you? How's it been for you? How's it been to see people listening to this? It's been incredible. Uh, it's been very humbling. This has been like one of the biggest and most ambitious projects that I've ever done. And it feels, um, it feels like an artistic coming of age for me after doing like the YouTube clickbait music for such a long time and being able to like do something for real. And Mm. it's really hard to get, uh, companies and brands and, uh, big names to recognize the legitimacy of independent uh content like content creators and i've struggled with that a lot where it's like i'm doing a lot of the same things that these mainstream bands are i'm i'm capable of of singing and producing and mixing at the same level that a lot of these mainstream bands are but because i'm a youtube guy i don't Mm -hmm. get invited to the same sort Mm -hmm. of uh i know the feeling yeah yeah dude no i i mean i completely get where you're coming from and I think that this really shows your skill level in a very broad way because it is, Thank you, it feels very different from the stuff that you do. Well, like I this is not the Weller movie. I can't right? take, like, I can't take all the credit for it though, because the, the independent musicians that we brought onto this project absolutely carried it across the finish line. And, and I, I, I did do a lot of songs on this project, but there were, I, there's also a lot of songs that I didn't do on this project. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to tell me what your favorite one of those was, but which was the favorite one that you got to work on? Uh, man, I have to say the Tamio song, not, yeah. not just because uh, the Tamio song is right up my own personal alley, you know? Um, mm. but working with Matt Heafy was incredible. Uh, and uh your stream with him on his like twitch stream was so wild because he got so deep into music theory yeah and i was just like i need to like i have things i need to be doing and i'm <laughs> watching this twitch stream like it's a college lecture and uh it was a blast thank you so much man um so let's transition really quick because yeah. i should ask you about magic let's casually. talk about magic i yeah. i feel but i i don't want your fans to get mad at me because my fans are going to be for... so happy with this <laughs> all right man we've been talking for an hour normally that would be where i cut off but guess what it's my show <laughs> i can talk for as long as i want my listeners have proven that they will listen to everything and there they're you gonna go eat this one up so I hear you play Commander, a format I, I am familiar with. <laughs> familiar with? Oh, you yeah. you are very humble, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Who's your, I, who's your general? Oh, man. Well, it depends on what kind of mood well, I'm in. What's your pet deck, I guess? Uh, well, that uh, still depends on what <laughs> mood I'm in. If, How many if, do you got? Uh, I own 50 Commander decks of... Good v- man. V- <laughs> <laughs> 50 commander decks of vastly varying power levels uh if i'm feeling really pissed off and i need to teach somebody a lesson i pull out <laughs> my my yuriko deck um, god damn <laughs> yuriko is such a pain in my yeah my side i don't man. i don't play it like a blue player though okay i play it like i play it like a jund player because <laughs> that's that's who i am that's who i am deep down so there's no, <laughs> there's no force of wills. There's no, you know, there's none of that, but there is a dig through time on top of my library. That's going to drain everybody for nine or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Oh so. my God, dude. Yuriko would be so much better if it just had commander tax on the ninja too. <laughs> like why does the damn thing dude, cost I've, me? I've talked with free? Gavin about this so many times. It makes me so mad. Every time, every time I play against Gavin Verhey, he beats me game one and then I pull out Yuriko because I get mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> and every time he's like, I shouldn't have designed that card that way. Oh my God. <laughs> like Yuriko, like if you ever want to see Gavin just get really irritated, talk to him about Yuriko and Najila and he'll just be like yeah (laughs) yep yeah i also um i have uh i have a deck um oh man i i'm I'm gonna look like such a fool on 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 this podcast i'm forgetting the names of the partners 
the they're both the uncommons uh from commander legends the, there were 45 partners uh, i know i know i know <laughs> the the uh, the wolf that gives uh com, uh something indestructible uh the the green four mana wolf right 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 mm-hmm. uh whatever everybody knows which one i'm talking about the the wolf and then the the coin flip guy that's like a diet feather that like returns <laughs> um you like flip a coin and return yes. an instant or sorcery back to your hand the reason i forget the name of the commander is because it's it's not well it's clark the thumbless yeah right? or d- does that's clark the... let you partner yes Clark yeah, the so, yeah so it's clark. Flip, it's clark back your hand i can't believe i forgot my boy clark but the reason i forgot my boy clark is because it's a hidden commander uh <laughs> it's it's actually a zada hedron, hedron grinder deck but i need green for silver for partisan um oh <laughs> so it's so it's a where it's a werewolf tribal feather deck what the hell in, in gruel and the first time i ever played it was against gavin and i had never tested it and i i, I said to gavin <laughs> look i built this entire deck around the the janky standard combo of zada hedron grider and silver fur partisan <laughs> <laughs> and uh for anybody that doesn't know you target zada hedron grinder with an instant or sorcery spell usually a, a pump spell and uh he copies that spell for every other creature you control and it targets each of them uh individually so if you have a silver for partisan and a bunch of wolf tokens out it copies for each of those wolves individually which means that the silver for partisan like doubles your wolf count uh because of all the targets coming from zada that are getting copied so i (laughs) so i said the sentence to gavin during that game i have 65 land drops remaining because i cast (laughs) because i cast a scale the heights i cast a scale the heights which is a three mana common rarity sorcery from the new zendikar that says target put, put a one one counter on target creature uh draw a car or maybe it draws Put a, a one card. encounter on it gain two life you can play an additional land and then yeah, draw a card. yeah so i played scale the heights targeting zada and i had like 30 wolves out or something oh god so <laughs> yeah by the way the wolf you were talking about is anara the wolfid familiar yes yes so i drew half my deck uh i i just like took out all the lands in my hand and put them on the put them on the field and then i had like three different ways that i could win with uh, i'm sure gavin was thrilled i mean it was he loves it he loves yeah, it when people it was a fun i mean it was the That's first awesome. time i had ever tested the deck and it just it popped off harder than i've ever popped off before that is the best feeling though yeah right like when you build a deck and you're like I did not expect this to happen, yeah. but that is why I play Commander. I live for those moments, by the way. Like yeah, I, I that's why we play Magic. Like I, you know, because for a while I had this Moldrotha deck, as every Salt Eye player does, you know, mm-hmm. and I tuned it too much, <sighs> and I wasn't having fun with it anymore because I had, like, I had like the Gitrog Monster Dredge combo oh, in there. I had like the uh i had the protean hulk into i had the protean hulk combo before i even knew that flash was a card because (laughs) i because i was building a moldrotha deck i was building this moldrotha deck before i knew about anything about the cedh meta so i didn't even know about flash hulk and i was building protean hulk into mickey's walking ballista whatever oh my Uh, god and then uh, it was right around the time that you guys banned Flash, I think, that, that, that I real I was like, I'm I never I never play this deck because it's not fun. And the, right? the last well, time I played it, uh, I have this friend Thomas uh, who used to be a judge at my my LGS, and he came over and he he looked at me. He was like, John, I want to play a a really uh, hardcore commander game one v one with you, and I pulled out this Mildrotha deck. And he had like a Scarab God deck that he like tuned to be like a hyper control deck. And, uh, and we dealt our hands and I looked at him. I was like, do you have a force? Cause if not, I win. <laughs> and that was it. It was like, okay, we played our try hard commander. Well, there, game. There's your, there's your hardcore yeah, commander game. Dark ritual in tomb reanimate protean Hulk win. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's like, that wasn't okay, fun. Buddy, okay. <laughs> yeah. 
GGs, man. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. I So my big thesis in life is I want people to sit down and play and have fun, Commander. Obviously, I'm an extremist, and I'm like, dude, detune your deck, play garbage yeah. card, play the... Like, I want people to dig through the bins and find, like, trash from Mercadian Master Homelands and be like, look, I play this because it reminds me of my childhood, or I love this yeah. card, or it's a vanilla 6-6, six, six, but I don't care because it was the card that I loved. Yeah. I mean, I'm not telling people don't play the fun, big, powerful cards. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is, if you over-optimize your deck, then you're not going to have fun because yeah. all you're doing is like, I know the lines to win. I'm going to win. Okay. You won. Yeah. And there's so much discourse. Now what do we do? There's so much discourse in the commander community about that right now too, because it's all like, the time, all the time. Cause, cause I mean, obviously people want to play with what they want to play with. Yeah. But like, it's, I'm not it's, here to judge. I'm just here to yeah. say like, look, you, what we need to do is we need to figure out why are we sitting down to play? Yeah. Like if you're sitting down because I want to try to, do these busted combos and I want to win as fast as I can find somebody else who wants to do that. Yeah. Ram your decks into each other. Great time. Yeah. If you're like, yo, you know what? I built this soldier deck out of just jank comments from alliances or whatever. Maybe don't sit down with the person who's trying to beat you on turn one with them too. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. And, and that's why like, and it's, it's tough, right? Because like yeah, it's absolutely. A, a lot of times people aren't good at talking to each other and they're not good at being open <laughs> about that kind of stuff. And, no. and my biggest fear is that I'll get my friends into magic and they'll play against somebody that ruins it for them. You know what I mean? Like yes, that, that's I, my I, daily. <laughs> Cause like, so that's why, like I always tell people like when they ask me about magic, I, I you know, and especially, especially lately i've had a lot of these musician friends that have been like yo like this magic thing is crazy how do i play and i always always tell them like look go to an lgs look through the 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 penny boxes until you find a card that just looks cool to you and just go yes just just get going and just build something fun and 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 it's funny because almost everybody that like is interested in this they always are like well i've heard that magic is expensive and it's like, well, but it's not if if you don't. Magic is a lot of things. Yeah, like people think that magic is like. Black Lotus is. <laughs> right, right. But also like so many people from the outside looking in think that magic is one game. Mm -hmm. But really it's like, you know, uh, like I, I said it's on. an umbrella. Yeah, I, I made this this video earlier uh, where I was opening up my care package that uh, Wizard sent me. And I mean, it's no different than like you have a deck of regular playing cards. You can play poker. You can play five different kinds of poker. You can play, you know, rummy. You can play solitaire. Um, and not many people realize that it's the same thing with magic. And mm -hmm. uh, I wish they did because like I feel like there's so many people I know who don't realize how much fun they would have with like, OK, we're all coming over tonight. Uh, we're all going to you know we're all gonna take a 20 dollar bill go to the lgs build a deck with just that 20 dollar bill and then yeah and then play together you know what i mean i'm a big fan of that yeah i mean cause look there's some people who treat magic like a very serious game with a lot of like focus and tournament and then some people are like magic is board game night right. right like i'm just me and my buddies are coming over we're gonna grab some decks and i'm not saying that this doesn't mean that your deck is low powered audience i understand there's high powered people who like to play what I'm saying is, what is your mindset going in? Yeah. And there's people who are like, man, I tried Magic and it sucked. I'm like, what did you play? Oh, I grabbed a Canlander deck and I ran it. I'm Oof. like, okay, well, <laughs> if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get crushed and yeah. it's going to suck. Yeah. But if you're like, there's like 50 ways to play Magic. Yeah. Maybe you want to play Popper. Maybe you want to play Modern. Like, I have a deck for every format except for Vintage. Yeah. And I will play whatever anybody wants to play with me. Yeah. And there's just like... Sometimes you just want to play one-on-one -on -one commander or brawl or yeah. whatever it is with your buddy. That's hard it's to fine. explain. That's hard to explain yeah. to people that don't understand like how that works. Cause like, like with me, it's, especially it's really tough. Cause like I'm a spike, you know, like I go hot. Like I've made number one on, on arena. I've, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. when were you yeah. going to bring that one up? But <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I made number one on arena. Uh, I, I think, uh, that was when throne was still legal in standard. <laughs> I think I was playing Gruel, Questing Beast, Embercleave, and oh, I, I okay, just, I just <laughs> right up to number one. Uh, but I've made Mythic on Arena several times, playing Historic and Standard. I usually make 
diamond draft on arena every season i've been dude i've already spent so many gems on so draft. many gems on Kamigawa. yeah man. uh kamigawa is such a good draft set but um it's, it's one of my top three of all time oh agreed 100 percent agreed uh but anyway uh, <laughs> uh but like yeah so like w- suffice to say i'm a spike but even though i'm a spike some of the best nights i've ever had playing magic was like you know three shots of whiskey in i got the boys over and it's like yo i got some dwarfs and they got some cars <laughs> and i'm gonna fight you you know like I've, I've got some big old dinosaurs and i'm drunk <laughs> i need to introduce you to tappy toe claws this i've met exactly tappy your... toe claws She's... at at the uh, i went to that command zone party that i mentioned to you before we started recording and <laughs> and um Tappy is one of my dearest friends and is exactly that. She's like a PhD in physics and or in like biology and also drinks like a fish. Yeah. And plays I, dumb dinosaur commander. I, it was funny because I met her at this party when I, I went up to LA to meet some of the command zone guys with Gavin and nobody, I didn't know anybody there except Gavin and, and uh, one of the editors on the command zone, Jake boss. And, uh, and I met Tappy and uh we like bonded over how we're both from the midwest and we both love dinosaurs and uh yeah see and then i think that she had a lot of drinks and uh then i followed her on twitter and i I, i'm like 90 percent sure she has no idea who i am now (laughs) she she's like who is this guy it's like no if you want to play (laughs) taffy's wednesday night commander i guarantee you she will in I would, I would love it. to play with Tappy anytime. She, Dude, she she's, was... she's one of the greatest people on the internet. One of my dearest friends. Yeah. Um, she's great. And dude, I, I, cause I crashed with her at a GP once and it was like, you know, seven or eight in the morning and we're about to go into the con hall and she's like, well, there's a beer here. So I'm just going to kill this right now. And I'm like, it is ass o'clock. What are you doing? <laughs> she's like shower beer. Yeah. Leave me alone. I'm like, there it is. girl, get it. Um, so god damn i really want to play with you man i think it would be super yeah. fun yeah uh, yeah this is sweet you know what this has been a really cool talk uh what is your favorite way to play magic oh man that's such a big question um yeah. <laughs> you know probably at the probably at the kitchen table with the with with the squad you know yeah uh i love arena i love magic online i love spell table i'll play magic however anybody wants to play magic but you know um well it meant more in the sense of like are you commander are you popper guy what's your jam i think when i want to have fun i play commander uh like when i want to have fun i like i think i'm i'm like it's you know it's 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 the duality of man you know like there's (laughs) there's there's two magic players inside of me there's there's the magic player that sorts through my collection to find that one uncommon that I know I have that I want to put into my, my janky stupid little commander deck. And I think that's when I'm like at peace and at, you know, at my, my most comfort level is when I'm building janky, silly decks, uh, usually in commander, but there's also this other side of me that wants to win. (laughs) And, uh, usually when I want to win, it's either uh usually when i want to win it's it's um modern and sometimes on arena i i i love pioneer i think pioneer is so cool i think my top two favorite formats are commander and pioneer because commander is what i play with my friends and i love singleton because of how unique every game is uh but pioneer lets me scratch my deck building itch and still mm. win uh there's some weird decks in pioneer man yeah that inverter deck still gets me like yeah what the hell what is this going on yeah well didn't they ban yeah they did because it was broken in half man well because that's kind of why pioneer died is because no pioneer died because covid happened that too but i remember before covid pioneer was in a bad place I think it's a lot better now. Yeah. Especially, but it's, it's also just like, it's such a, if, if Watsy spent time and put it onto arena pioneer would be one of the most popular formats. Listen, if, 
if Watsy, I'm going to go on record and say this right now because I'm not affiliated with the arena team at all. I, I've done some work for Wizards, but I know that the arena team, I think, is is a separate yeah. a- entity. But um, uh, if Watsy puts Pioneer on arena, like, I'm never going to do anything else other than play arena. <laughs> like, seriously. Like, 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 you know, people can talk about, like, you know, gems, spending money on gems. Like, you should play paper. Like, I don't care. I, I will lit- if, if they put Pioneer on arena, I'm in. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm in neck deep into arena if they put Pioneer on there. Because cause I, I want to be able to, I want to be able to play a stupid draft archetype and then be like, hmm. I wonder if I could pull, I wonder if I could, you know, get away with this draft archetype yes. in arena and modern used to be like that before modern horizons. And I, I like, I like modern, but that's not modern anymore. You can't play your favorite draft archetype in modern anymore. Um, no, you can't and, like that's, that's one of the things like, that's why I enjoyed brawl a lot. Brawl. Yeah. Let me keep my draft decks and play it. But same way. Like I've tried to, I, I've done used commander that way. Like, yeah. Oh, this was my favorite standard deck, like playing infinite thopters in Kaladesh or like mutate Nethroi or whatever. And I'm like, I'm going to build this as a commander deck. Yeah. But then it's so easy and you get lost and like, okay, well I'll optimize it and I'll add these other cards. And yeah. Then you lose the flavor, but like playing something like a pioneer or like historic before they added all the alchemy, yeah. let you keep that kind of like, I'm building a block constructed deck and it's still going to work. You know, now that you said that, I know we've been talking for a while, but the, I've I've been wanting to get this off my chest for a long time. Yeah. And and listen, I played a lot of modern. Uh, I took a, I took a hiatus from modern uh, with uh, MH two because uh, dude, my elves deck doesn't work anymore because of MH two. Yep. I'm pissed. Uh, I took a hiatus with MH two because I just didn't have the headspace to learn all of the new. Uh, updates because you know i'm a jund guy i want to play my tarmogoyfs i want to play my lilianas <laughs> and i don't want to have to completely reset my like i i had i had my thought sees picks burned into my brain you know what i mean i knew exactly what to pick with inquisition or thought sees in mm-hmm. every matchup and like thinking about needing to relearn that for every updated deck with the MH2 cards. Which because, is every one of them. Yeah. Because MH2 basically rebuilt the whole system. Yeah. So I just like, I, I, my brain shorted out and I just haven't played modern very much since then, but um, I still love modern and I've, I've heard it's in a great place now, but it feels kind of like legacy light now, uh, or it feels yeah. like legacy did back before modern horizons. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but what I wanted to say though, is I am of the opinion that historic is faster than modern and i think that's i think that's a hot take man i think that i can prove it because the interaction in modern is so good that even mm. if a deck has the potential to win on turn three or turn four, you have the path to exile. You have the force of negation. Yeah. Now mm-hmm. you have the solitude. You have the thought seize. You have all of these different tools in modern in every single color for one mana or less. You can, <laughs> uh, you know, you can deal with any threat on the board. You can deal with any of these wacky combos. And then post sideboard, you have even more one or zero mana answers like uh, force of uh what if force of uh vigor of, yeah vigor <laughs> thank you uh <laughs> you have all these other tools you have like yeah. collector oof uh you have all these force different things endurance etc um, et yeah yeah all these like one mana like uh graph diggers i know graph diggers cages in historic as well and all, all these different things but sure, sure, sure. Uh, but in historic the interaction is not there yet you don't even have lightning bolt. So in his, and I played a lot of historic part when I got to number one mythic, but half of, half of that journey was playing historic decks. And when you lose in historic, you can't do crap about it because mm-hmm. somebody will play a Muxus and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they'll do it on turn four and you just lose on the spot or they'll play, um, they'll play a, a core spirit dancer or whatever. Is it a core spirit mm-hmm. dancer? The, the zero two that you stack auras on and it gets plus two plus two for each. Aura no, on that's, it. that's uh yes, 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 it is. Yeah. Uh, they'll play a core and yeah. Core spirit. Dancer. And, I love that card. Yeah. It's an amazing card, but there's no, uh, there's no fatal push in historic. Nope. There's no lightning bolt in historic. 
There's no path to exile in historic. In fact, nope, nope, most nope. colors do not have one mana instant speed interaction in historic at all. And black doesn't have access to inquisition. They just have thought seize, which means they lose faster to a lot of these fast mm -hmm. decks. Um, bl uh, black doesn't have fatal push. The best thing white has, I think, is that uh, Soren's dad is gone because Olivia stole her uh white two mana instant <laughs> uh i don't remember the name of the card but uh, it's yeah though it, it's like the the wall one isn't it um what the hell it makes it? a clue token it's like yes it's like the oh. it's like the strictly better fateful absence yeah fateful ans uh, yeah, yeah 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 uh yeah so white's best bet is fateful absence which is you're not winning at the mana efficiency game if you're fateful absencing a core spirit dancer and you're taking your whole turn to kill their mm -hmm. core spirit dancer before they can make it hex proof or whatever. Yeah. Before the bogles come out and yep. it just becomes this like big pile of, and then like, that's my favorite commander. Deck so right so now, it, like, like in modern, when you're stabilizing against a death shadow or against a goblin guide or against a, a, a Delver, whatever the dragon Merc tide is, um, mm -hmm. or, or Ragavan, when you're stabilizing against those decks, a lot of times you can stabilize for one mana. So yeah. a lot of times on your turn three, you can like, uh, for me, at least in Jund, you could like fatal push your Ragavan, play a Tarmogoyf. I'm stable. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like now I've stabilized because the the my threats are efficient and my removal is even more efficient than my threats. Yeah. But in historic, it's not like that. So your turn three is going to be desperately trying to kill their core, desperately trying to kill their goblin chieftain, desperately mm -hmm. trying to kill their their Allosaur shepherd. And oh, God. yeah. And if you can't kill it, you lose. GG's. Like if you don't have that, if you don't dedicate your entire turn three to killing that threat, the game's over. So then historic games have a, the, the types of decks that you see in historic radicalize to either hyper combo aggro or hyper control. So either you have a deck that's completely based around instant speed interacting and, and memory lapsing. I know they banned that now, but yeah, uh, like but, counter spells. Yeah. But like, things. yeah, like, but that was, that was why memory lapse needed to be banned in historic memory lapse. Was yeah. Broken in half because it was the only way for you to stop Muxus, you know? Mm -hmm. So every deck that wasn't playing Allosaurus shepherd Muxus or core spirit dancer was playing memory lapse because it was the most efficient way to not die on turn four. So historic, the game is always decided on turn four, and that's not the case in modern. And for that reason, I can't brew in historic because in order for me to brew in historic, like I have to put in X number of staples just to survive past turn four. And then I'm just playing an, an already optimized deck. So that's why if they added pioneer yep. to arena, uh, I'm going to be the happiest person on the planet because um, I think that's one of the reasons why when I play arena, I stick to limited Yeah, because like the standard standard is fine. Whatever. Uh, I'll play standard on occasion. If it's like the blood on the snow decks or yeah. something like that, but like historic, I've just avoided entirely because you're either playing the meta or you're losing. Yep. And I don't want to play those games. Yeah. And it's not fun when there's like just everything you're doing is getting countered all day. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't need that. Yeah. That's and not what I'm here for. For that reason. That's why I feel like it's going to be so important for pioneer to come to arena at some point is because, uh, cause I know I have personal friends of mine who has who, this exact same scenario has played out. You play, you, you download arena for the first time. Cause it's, trendy you know mm. free to play whatever sure. uh it, it's the the hippest way to play magic um uh you've never played magic before and you start with standard because oh my god it's the worst uh because that's the i mean it's the most accessible format if you've never played before it makes the most sense to new players it makes sense that people would start with standard regardless of you know whatever anybody's opinion about standard is uh you start with standard you spend money on a standard deck and then your standard deck rotates. And if you aren't happy with the fact that your standard deck is rotating, and if you don't have the money to buy the next standard deck, then your options are limited brawl or historic. And that's it. 
And if you're a new player who's only been playing standard for one year's rotation of standard, you're mm. not going to be ready for historic because historic no. is mean. And <laughs> you probably aren't going to feel confident in a limited environment no. yet. There is no good like ramp into limited. Like what they need is like a hand holdy teach you how to draft limited. And they thing. need they need a bridge to eternal formats on arena. Yes. And Pioneer is the perfect bridge because all these Kamigawa draft archetypes, vehicles, you could play a vehicle deck and get, you know, like seven and oh or whatever mm. the whatever the turn tournaments are mm -hmm. uh, you could make mythic with vehicles in pioneer if it was on arena uh the kamigawa draft archetypes uh enchantress you could play enchantress and pioneer and hit mythic easily uh what else uh you've got ninjas yeah Samurai, ninjas Exalted, yeah rogue yeah. rogue ninja tribal you could 100 percent hit mythic on arena with pioneer uh and just literally you know if you started playing in, in kamigawa keep your draft yeah archetype they deck. need to have because Historic used to be like that, yep. but then the, when they added the direct Strixhaven. historic stuff, yeah, Strixhaven the, the, the too, Strixhaven, Strixhaven and freaking Jumpstart, yeah, just like broke historic. Suddenly, historic is like vintage tier, yeah, right? Like it's arena vintage. It's not arena yeah. modern. Yeah, it's like oh, you're either like, and you can't just take your standard deck into historic. You will get skull crushed. And like, if you're this old school vintage type player you're forced to kind of make a choice between do I want to build a legacy deck or do I want to build a historic deck? And it's a completely different metagame, a completely different format. And for me, if I could go to my LGS and find some pioneer cards and then come home and play the exact same deck on arena, like you'll never hear from me again. Cause I'll just be <laughs> playing arena for the rest of my life. You know, I wish magic would do what Pokemon does which is sell you the packs or the cards or whatever, and then give you a digital card that lets you take your physical cards that you bought and use them in the client. That would be sick. But that is a different rant altogether. Yeah. My friend, it is, I have to edit this show. Which yes, means you do. That, <laughs> which means that I'm going to be editing two shows. But you know what? This has been an incredible talk. I would love to have you back on anytime because I think we could talk for another five yeah, hours. Yeah, definitely. Um, but this is the plug time of the show. So if people wanted to find you or the Kamigawa soundtrack or anything like that, any of the work you've done, where could they go? Yes. On most social media sites, I am Jonathan Y music, J O N A T H A N young, uh, or Y on Twitter and Instagram, uh, music, Why? uh, just, <laughs> uh, just search for Jonathan young. Uh, and, uh, I have a ton of music available on Spotify, uh, on YouTube as well. Uh, and if you want to hear, the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty official soundtrack. Uh, just search for Kamigawa on Spotify or YouTube. Yeah. Um, uh, Apple Music, a uh, bunch of music platforms. Um, yeah, it's available everywhere. Uh, the link to to find the album on your favorite music platform should be on all of the music videos mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube, on all of the different social media sites. Um, you should be able to find a link pretty easily um yeah and it's an official magic the gathering release so you can also just search for magic the gathering as an artist on a music mm. platform and it'll come up um and be sure to check out all of the other musicians on the project as well i know i've been talking a lot but uh there's so many amazing amazing people that made yeah. this soundtrack possible and brought their own uh their own artistic vision and their own interpretation of the Kamigawa lore to this project. Um, and uh, yeah. So I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. He says two hours into the yeah. show. <laughs> two hours into the one hour show. I'm um, so sorry. <laughs> no, dude, it's my fault. I could have cut you off at any time and I didn't cause I was having a good time, Yeah, but it's on me to do this. Yeah. You know what? That's fine. Anyways, you can find me at Garapuri Gears on Twitter. You can find this show anywhere podcasts are sold or at Cool Stuff Inc. every Tuesday or on YouTube when I get around to uploading it afterwards, uh, sporadically. And remember, my friends, it is not magic without the gathering. And we will see you next time.